Hey everyone, this lesson is on middle ear infections. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the risk factors for getting a middle ear infection, what causes them, the signs and symptoms of a middle ear infection, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So a middle ear infection is also known as acute otitis media. As its name suggests, it is an infection of the middle ear. So if we actually look at this diagram here, here is the anatomy of the ear. Here is the external ear flap, external auditory canal. And in this area here is the middle ear. So past the tympanic membrane or the eardrum inside this area is the middle ear. And this is where we have an infection. And with a middle ear infection or acute otitis media, we see fluid buildup and inflammation in this area. So here is what an eardrum or the tympanic membrane looks like when we look inside someone's ear. And in a middle ear infection, it is bulging because there is fluid in behind that eardrum. Now, a middle ear infection often occurs during or after an episode of an upper respiratory tract infection. So that's important to note. And we'll talk about why that happens in the upcoming slides. The epidemiology of a middle ear infection is important to note as most often this occurs in young children. Although it can happen in all ages, it's more likely to occur in younger children, especially between the ages of six months and two years of age. And the risk and incidence of a middle ear infection decreases substantially after the age of five. And it's also important to note that this is a very common condition. Many, many children will often have an episode of a middle ear infection at some point in their life. Now let's talk about the risk factors of getting a middle ear infection. One of them is exposure to cigarette smoke. So if a baby or infant is exposed to secondhand smoke, this is a risk factor for getting a middle ear infection. Vitamin A deficiency is also a risk factor. Genetic predisposition, so certain individuals have genetic abnormalities in their immune system functioning that can preclude them to having a middle ear infection. Children or individuals who have issues with allergies are also at an increased risk for middle ear infections. Lower socioeconomic status is a risk factor. Family history is a risk factor. So individuals in the family, particularly first degree relatives like parents or other siblings, if they have had issues with middle ear infections, the patient is more likely to have issues with middle ear infections. Personal history of middle ear infections is also a risk factor. So as with most things in medicine, if there has been a history of something occurring, it's more likely to occur in the future. Ear surgeries are also a risk factor. So if there's been any cochlear implants, this is a risk factor for getting middle ear infections. Immunosuppression, so issues with immune system functioning, increases the risk of all infections. And one of them is a middle ear infection. And in infants, not being breastfed is also a risk factor. Some other risk factors include pacifier use, daycare attendance, those types of risk factors as well. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of a middle ear infection. Now it is an infection of the middle ear, so the infectious causes include bacteria, which are the most common causative organisms in a middle ear infection. And for individuals in medicine, the bacteria that are most common to affect or most common to cause a middle ear infection are the following, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenzae, and Moraxella catarrhalis. So oftentimes these are bacteria that are often memorized in medicine for causing a middle ear infection. Viruses can also cause a middle ear infection. These include respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, some influenza viruses, coronaviruses, adenoviruses, and human metanumoviruses. So Although, again, bacteria are the most common causes, those three in particular, viruses can also cause middle ear infections as well. And as I mentioned before, a middle ear infection often occurs in the setting of an upper respiratory tract infection, so an infection of the nasopharynx. So because the eustachian tubes, so if you look in this diagram here, the eustachian tubes are connected to the middle ear and are also connected to the nasal canal, if there's an infection in this area, it can lead to inflammation and edema within the eustachian tube. Because of that inflammation and edema within the eustachian tube, this can lead to issues with drainage of the eustachian tube, causing a proliferation of infective organisms like bacteria and viruses that lead to acute otitis media. So we can eventually lead to a scenario where there is a buildup of bacteria and a buildup of fluid and inflammation in this area. What are some of the signs and symptoms of a middle ear infection? By far the most important symptom of a middle ear infection is ear pain or otalgia. Now what's often noted is that 
because we see this in children most often, the child often pulls on their pinna. They pull on the ear flap. Oftentimes they'll pull down on the ear flap and this helps relieve some of their pain. So pulling on the ear flap helps relieve some of that pain because it relieves some of the pressure on the tympanic membrane. And what's also noted is that this otelgia is worse when lying down. So the otelgia is oftentimes worse at night for these patients. Some other signs of a middle ear infection include discharge or debris, so autorrhea. This is most often going to happen in the setting of a perforated tympanic membrane or a perforated eardrum. So if there's a little hole in the eardrum, because there's so much fluid in behind the eardrum, that fluid can leak out and you can see that fluid coming out of the ear. Headaches can also occur if there's pressure in the middle ear. Patients can sense that and have a sensation of a headache. There can also be a fever because this is an infection. There's a fever oftentimes that's involved, but more often than not, it is a low-grade fever. It's uncommon for the fever to be greater than 40 degrees Celsius. Some other signs and symptoms that are associated with a middle ear infection include nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, and loss of appetite. And as I mentioned before, middle ear infection is often associated with an upper respiratory tract infection. So it either happens after an upper respiratory tract infection or during an upper respiratory tract infection. So we're going to see symptoms of an upper respiratory tract infection. These include nasal congestion, runny nose, and a sore throat. So we can see these symptoms as well. Now, acute otitis media can progress into another condition we call otitis media with effusion. And I bring this up because otitis media with effusion, or OME, can have extra symptoms. So they can have the symptoms we talked about before in the last slide, but they can also have tinnitus or tinnitus, which is a ring of the ears, they can have a reduction or loss of hearing, and they can have vertigo, so that sensation of the room spinning. So they can have these signs and symptoms as well, and they often have a very severe or worsened otalgia or worsened ear pain. So in addition to the symptoms we talked about in the last slide, they can have these symptoms as well. Now let's talk about the diagnosis and treatment of middle ear infections. The diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis. From the history and from the physical examination, the diagnosis is made. So this is done by using otoscopy or an otoscope, which clinicians will use to look inside the ear and look at the eardrum. So here is a normal eardrum, and here is an eardrum that is affected by acute otitis media. And as you can note here, the acute otitis media eardrum is bulging in appearance. And there's some other notes that are made by the clinician, including they'll look for perforations, the color changes of the eardrum, those types of signs. So oftentimes the diagnosis can be made by looking at the eardrum. And with a pneumatic otoscope, the pneumatic otoscope can be used as well. This sends a puff of air into the ear. And in the case of a normal eardrum, that puff of air will move the eardrum. In the case of acute otitis media or middle ear infection, that puff of air will not move the eardrum. So there will not be a movement in the eardrum because there's fluid in behind the eardrum. How do clinicians treat this condition? Most often this condition may be self-limiting, so some clinicians will practice a watch and wait approach. However, in some cases where there is a higher fever, there is other symptoms involved, or if it's taking longer for this to resolve, or if the patient is younger than the age of six, oftentimes high dose amoxicillin may be used. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like NSAIDs can be used for pain management, so you can think of medications like ibuprofen or Advil. And in the case of a patient having four or more episodes of acute otitis media over the course of 12 months, they may be considered for meningotomy with tube placement. So if you've ever heard of patients or little children getting tubes placed in their ear, this may be the reason. So again, this is a clinical diagnosis. It may be self-limiting, but it can be treated with amoxicillin. NSAIDs are used for pain management, and then tubes can be placed in individuals who have four or more episodes of acute otitis media per year. If you found this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.